going to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis, chapter number 3. Well, it is that time of year again when I begin to read through my Bible with the goal of uh, reading it all the way through by December 31st of next of this year, I guess it is now. It's not so much the task of just trying to go through the Bible each and every year, but as I endeavor to do so, I, I bring my, my mind and my heart into the presence of God and His Word. And so by trying to read through the entire Bible each year, I really expose myself to every book and every chapter and every verse of God's inspired and infallible living Word. Now, are there days that I don't feel as moved as much by my reading? Absolutely, yes, of course. But you know, I found that if my soul is quiet before Him, I, I find that the Lord is always ready and willing uh, to bring to my soul truth that He wants me to learn and to know and to experience. And so I want to challenge you uh, on this first Sunday of the new year. I know we're already into it, but I want to challenge you uh, to set your sights on a daily time in God's Word. Now, whether you read through the Bible or not is not really important to me. I think it's a good exercise, but I think it's really important that we determined, and I should be maybe one of the highest of your resolutions for this year, that you spend time with God every day. So it was that on Thursday, I read Genesis chapter 3 and the tragic episode of the Garden of Eden. Eve is beguiled by the devil who appears to her in the form of a very attractive servant, a very alluring serpent, and she is really confronted with the full enticement of temptation. In verse number 6, we read, and when the woman, we're not going to look at these, this story in detail, just some highlights. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there is lust of the eyes, or lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So Eve was beguiled, she yielded, she gave to Adam, who chose to eat of the fruit, and at that moment they died spiritually, and they ran from God. Now God came looking for Adam. God came searching him out, and he confronted Adam, and the blame game was played for the very first time. Verse 11, and this is God speaking, and he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, of the woman whom thou gavest to be with thee, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And then the Lord addresses Satan, who is come in this form of a serpent. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And we know that there were other consequences. Eve would be told about her grief in giving birth to children. She would find out that her position now moved to be subservient to her husband. Adam was then taught also that he would not have the natural bounty of the earth just springing up, but he would have to earn his keep by the sweat of his brow. But the Lord spoke also in this conversation words of hope and forgiveness and salvation. In verse 15, as he is still addressing the serpent, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed, your descendant, so to speak, and her seed, her descendant. Her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. God, in these very earliest days of human existence at the very beginning of our Bible, states that one day there would be a man that would come that would defeat Satan and defeat the power of sin once for all. 
Galatians chapter 4 tells us about that. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Of course, I've continued to read since that chapter, and yesterday I read Genesis chapter 5 through chapter 9, and the story of the increasing wickedness of the entire human race. You see, once Adam and Eve sinned, they plunged the entire human nature, all of their descendants, into sin. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so then death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The Bible makes it very clear. There is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And as Romans tells us in chapter 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 6 in Genesis relates the story of the world, the condition of the world, and the coming judgment of God upon the world because of their wicked, sinful hearts. It tells us, it begins the story of of a man named Noah and the ark that would save him and his family and all air-breathing creatures. And his story is really a revelation. It shows the nature of God in his righteous dealings with humanity. And I want to read a few verses over these next couple of chapters and and learn how uh, Noah was to handle all of these things. All right, so in chapter number six, let's begin in verse five. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Boy, I'll tell you, that's a profound verse. Everywhere God looked, man's heart was set on doing iniquity, set on sinning, set on going against God. Let's remember that thought. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without and without with pitch. Well, the Lord goes on to give Noah all the details and instructions he would need to build such a vessel and how he was to pre- prepare it and get ready. Now, chapter number 7 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, by the way, it took Noah 120 years to build that ark. All the time preaching to those around. He was a preacher of righteousness. Verse 5 of chapter 7. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Verse number 9. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. Verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in 
went in male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift above the earth. Verse 23, and every living substance was destroyed which upon, was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowls of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Chapter 8. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. Now chapter number 9 and verse 8. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him saying, and behold, and I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And then I want to drop down to verse 12. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And then we're going to come back to Genesis in just a moment. I want you to turn to 2 Peter all the way pretty much to the other end of your Bible. 2 Peter, chapter number 3. By the way, this is all introduction. Just to prepare you. Now, did you catch that? Let's talk a little bit about no before we look at these next verses, all right? So, and I realize today that a good number of you, if not almost all of you, are familiar with that story from Genesis, the story of Noah. We understand that the world was in a very wicked, wicked condition, and God decided to destroy the world by a universal flood. But God also then made a provision for Noah and his family. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and Noah spent, it was not a rash, quick thing that just came upon the earth instantly. It was something that God allowed as, Mo, or as Noah built that ark for all of those years. And people came and, and mocked him and uh, saw what he was doing. And he continually preached unto them and called them to join him in that ark. But they mocked him and said, no way. But the day came. God said, everybody, all those animals will come in and they will enter the ark. Noah and his family would enter the ark, and God shut the door, and the judgment did come. So at a time of great destruction, God provided a way of escape. Now, when it was all said and done, the ark was back down, and they were coming off the ark. God spoke to Noah, and he talked to him about a covenant. And he said, by covenant, I'm going to remind you that I will never, ever again destroy the world by a universal flood. And he said, here is my covenant. When the clouds come, and you might panic a bit because it had never rained before the flood, and so now when they see clouds coming and, you know, a good thunder cloud coming up or whatever, they might get a little bit scared. He said, I'm going to put my bow in the sky so that you'll be reminded that I'm not going to destroy the world by water ever again. The token of God's covenant. But that is not to say that God will not judge the world. And I want you to notice this in 2 Peter chapter number 3. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Here's the heart of God, but is long-suffering to usward, 
not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ye ought to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness." No more destruction by water, but God says one day this world will be burned up. Now, one last thing before we leave Noah, and I want you to turn back one page, maybe the same page for you, in 2 Peter chapter number 2, and I want you to notice one verse. It's talking about an earlier judgment. This is speaking of God, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, these many years later, we often refer to that ship, that gigantic boat, the ark, as being a, a type or a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who come to him, those who come into him, uh, they are the ones that are rescued and they find salvation from judgment. And you know, that's the way God's always worked. We saw the promise of it in Genesis chapter 3. We see a typology of it given to us in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. Now, the last chapters of the book of Genesis, and I said we would return there, and you can turn to chapter 45, are all about a young man by the name of Joseph. And what an amazing story of how while he was just a teenager, God gave him two dreams which basically showed that his family would one day gather around him and actually physically bow before him. And of course, it was a dream that was not well received by his brothers. They hated him already, and we're not going to look at his story very much. But let me say this. Joseph understood that God had a plan that would bring him into prominence above his family, and that somehow, some way, they would one day acknowledge him as such and bow before him. Now, I'm not going to review all of his story, but to say that 20 years later, after much suffering, much things going wrong in his life, and yet trusting God through it all, the Lord did bring those dreams to reality. Now, in chapter 45, we know that there was a famine. We know that God had elevated uh, Joseph to be second in command of all of Egypt and the grain had been stored now and during the years of plenty and now is about to uh, it was already into the second year and Joseph his brothers came down to buy food you know the story and as they came down they bowed before him but finally in Genesis 45 Joseph revealed himself his his identity to his brothers okay verse number four Genesis 45, beginning in verse 4. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father and a pharaoh and the lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Hmm. You see, Joseph had come to understand that that dream of two decades earlier really wasn't about just him and his, you know, his blood brothers bowing before him, but it really was about God working to preserve life. God was going to go and to save them alive. Hmm. 
That's what the Bible says. Well, 400 years later, the status of the family of Israel had changed from favored guests in the land to slaves forced to serve Egyptian taskmasters with rigor. And I'm going to invite you to turn to Exodus chapter number 3. You're thinking, are we going to survey the whole Old Testament today, Pastor? Well, that would be a good way to start the year. We considered this actually a little bit last week. And God met with Moses on that backside of the desert, the burning bush, and he brought such wonderful words of promise and hope again coming from the Lord. Chapter 3 and verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse number 12. And he said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be the token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So once again, we see God coming to deliver his people from situations from which they could not deliver themselves. And when God began to work and bring that judgment, to bring them out, we know that he brought ten tremendous plagues upon that land. Some of them impacted the nation of Israel. Uh, some only impacted the nation of Egypt. But then God, of course, at last brought the greatest judgment, death of all the firstborn to every home, Israelite and Egyptian. But God said in preparation for that death angel coming throughout the land and taking the firstborn, I'm going to give you a way of escaping that death. And that escape was to take a male lamb without blemish and to slay that lamb and to take, capture his blood and to take that blood then and with a dish uh, and a hyssop branch, take it and sprinkle it upon the doorpost of a door. And God said that in that night, all of those who gather inside of that home, when the death angel goes throughout the land, God said those famous words, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And again, we have another beautiful picture of people being in a, in a serious situation, unable to deliver themselves, being in bondage and darkness and hardship, and God coming and providing a way of deliverance. You know, this wonderful book that we have before us this morning is literally filled with that truth. And I am come down to deliver them. Well, we're going to end our little survey of the Old Testament. But I think that you should understand that all 39 books of the Old Testament are filled with this same message. People in need and God coming to deliver them, to rescue them. And then we come to the New Testament and the complete gospel message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this time this morning. We've had a long introduction. Lord, really, the message that I have now is, is really probably more brief than the introduction. But, Lord, so important. And I ask, Father, that now, please, get our minds and our hearts thinking, reflecting upon the goodness and greatness of God. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there are certain truths found in our Bibles that cannot be ignored. They permeate the whole of Scripture because they reflect the very heart of God. They're not always spelled out exactly the same way, don't always use the same terms, but the message is always clear and foundational. And if we will listen to the voice of God, I believe that we'll be impressed upon the mind and heart of every sincere child of God. 
I think that we all understand that our world is becoming more and more outspoken in its rejection of anything biblical and pretty much anything that has to do with God or the God of the Bible. And it's not hard to apply that assessment that we saw back in Genesis chapter 6, you know, really concerning our world as it was in Noah's day. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. But you know, even those who are not particularly anti-God are at best completely ignorant of the Bible, its content, and yes, its terminology. And sometimes we, we find it hard to explain God's truth. And we search for more... Um, contemporary phrases to communicate eternal truth. I know that oftentimes if I feel led of God to return to a message that I preached maybe a decade ago, uh, that as I go through and, and rework the message and, and re-prepare and pray over it, I find many times that there, uh, there are words, things that I need to change, phrases that I need to adjust, uh, trying to make it understandable, uh, as, as understandable as possible. But on the other hand, there are certain truths and terms which cannot and should not be altered. And they must be left as they are, for in them rest the power of God. One such word is the word save. Save. It is the translation of the Greek word Sodso, which means to rescue from peril, to protect, to keep alive. It involves the preservation of life, especially as it is used in relation to eternity. I would suggest this morning that save is one of those words that cannot be ignored. Its truth is throughout the whole of Scripture. It is what God is all about. God is a saving God, rescuing those who cannot save themselves. You understand that the Pharisees and the leaders of Israel mocked Jesus, our Savior, while he was on the cross. Luke tells us in Luke 23, And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with him derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. Can we even begin to imagine this Bible without the message of save? Acts chapter 2, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. As we read this morning and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Romans chapter 5, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans 8, for we are saved by hope. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 1 Corinthians, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, to unto us which which are saved, it is the power of God. First Timothy chapter 2, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. You know, the obvious questions that spring from all this, who needs to be saved? Why do they need to be saved? Why does God desire that all men be saved? And who is willing to do the saving? Now, those might seem basic questions, and indeed they are. And I understand today that we are gathered today as a company of believers, most of us. People who are living out the experience of being saved. And I understand that maybe I am not sharing anything new, but let's remind and refresh ourselves in this foundation of God's faith. You see, because... 
We, the human race of all sin, we're under the condemnation for our sin. And that condemnation is death and eternity in hell. And therefore, ever, every person born into this world needs to be saved. And we cannot save ourselves. We need a Savior, and he is Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, I've quoted so many times from this pulpit. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why he came to earth to give his life a ransom for many. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so again in Scripture we read, Luke chapter 19, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul adds, of whom I am chief. So we've answered the foundational questions that face every human being. Who needs to be saved? Every single individual. No one can ever be considered as being above the need of salvation. Those who think that somehow they can appease God enough to save themselves are sorely mistaken. The Bible is eminently clear not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us. Why do they need to be saved? Because of sin. We're born with it. We saw that because of Adam. Because of Adam, sin passed upon all men, and that all have sinned. So we are born with a sin nature, and then we choose the sin, and the wages of sin is death. If anybody has any hope of ever escaping the judgment of God, they must recognize the problem of sin in their heart and their need of a Savior, somebody who can do something for them that they cannot do for themselves. And I want to tell you this morning that that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews tells us, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is one of the most fundamental, if not the most fundamental truth of all the word of God. Humanity is great need, and the God who came to meet us in that need, to save us from our sins. And this message is simple, and it is satisfactory, and it is sacred. And it is a message with which you and I may not tamper. To confuse its simplicity is to rob it of its saving power. To treat it casually is to offend the triune Godhead who loved us and gave himself for us. A few weeks ago, the Lord reminded me how easy it is for we who hold this marvelous truth in our hands and our hearts to become distracted in life, to lose sight of this great truth that God has entrusted to us. A few weeks ago, as I was reading the last book of the Bible. So I'm going to invite you to turn there, book of Revelation. Finishing up my Bible reading for 2019. I was reading in Revelation chapter number 2. Chapters 2 and 3 have God's letters to seven churches. And it begins with the first church, a church located in Ephesus. It was a real church, but there's a lot of eternal message for us. I'm going to read, beginning in verse 1, unto the angel of the church at Ephesus. Remember, angel means messenger, so it really was directed at the shepherd of that flock, the pastor of that church. So if you want to start calling me Angel Connor, that will be okay. (laughs) Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, 
These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And that speaks of these churches. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. That's endurance and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. This is the assessment by God of this church at the city of Ephesus. And maybe you're familiar with that. that God makes it very clear that he said, you know, this, you as a church are busy and you're active and you're standing for right things and you hold right positions and you've got you know, a lot of things. You're, you're enduring through difficult times and you're going on and, and, and you've borne and you've had patience. Uh, for my name's sake, you've labored, you've not quit, you've been going on. But there's a problem. I have someone against you because you have left your first love. You know, when I read those words, the Holy Spirit impressed upon my heart this thought. As a called out assembly of saved, baptized believers, we have been brought together for the purpose of being a light in this city. We then must be diligent and passionate in upholding the truth of God which we have believed and which God has entrusted into our watch, care, and stewardship. In our obedience to the Great Commission, we must not lose sight of our main mission. Yes, the Lord Jesus himself should be our first love, but would that not also include his message of love to a lost human race. Was that not the commission that God gave to churches like ours, to us? To my thinking, your themes are most helpful when they are simple and easy to remember. And it's my desire and prayer that God would somehow lead and guide us each year to get us thinking of some great thought which can capture our hearts, change our direction, and maybe even change our lives. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what awaits us each year and what truth needs to fill our vision and thoughts. Now, I realize we have guests here this morning. You don't probably have uh, realized what I'm sharing today. I'm sharing with our church family a theme that I believe God's given us for this year. Now, I do not go up to Cypress Bowl, the lookout, and get a blanket out and sit there cross-legging and wait for God to speak. Okay? It's not how the vision comes. I don't even seemed to have time to get away for a few days to just wait on God and see what he had said. It, it just, I've never had that privilege, I guess I could say. God usually gives me the theme for the year by way of interrupting. Interrupting my thinking. Interrupting that something will just come sort of, I guess we could say, out of the, the blue, so to speak, and I am impressed in my mind and heart through all kinds of means. I obviously do not hear an audible voice from God, but I do sense the prompting and stirring of the Holy Spirit, and it's like God just turns on the light and says, this is it. Now, I've had the Lord lead me to a theme over a year in advance. Not too long ago we had that. But usually it is months in advance in the spring and the summer, and it gives me time to think about it and pray about it. It's not the, it, it's not the week between Christmas and New Year's. And I have time to 
ponder it, to meditate upon it, what God intends for my life and for the life of our church. So this morning, I'm humbled and personally challenged in my own life to share that our theme for 2020 is a simple phrase, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And my prayer is that my heart and yours will be refocused on what I believe is the very heart of God, bringing his good news to a lost and dying humanity. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I would, my prayer is that you and I would heed the counsel that God gave to the church at Ephesus, that we would repent of our distracted hearts, that we would return to doing the first works of every New Testament church. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. This year of 2020 holds a lot of promise for us and many opportunities and challenges. And as with many years, 2020 holds some milestones, anniversaries that will be important to our church and should be remembered. And this year, when we come to our spring revival with Dr. John Getch, it'll be his 20th visit to our church for revival. So we've held those spring revivals every year for 20 years this year. And uh, this year we're delaying a little bit, but it'll be in April. Camp Yes will celebrate 35 years of operation this summer. And this year will mark 30 years that we have called this location 4440 Victoria Drive, our church home. 30 years we've been in this building. God has been so good. A few weeks ago, I realized that when I realized that 2020 was our 30th year here, I began to think about, wow, this is, we could celebrate this. And I began to go through some, uh, I began to rehearse the exciting days and how God took over, really took over, and, and led us in every detail of our move to this location. And I was looking through some history pictures, and I came across a picture of what our building looked like when we moved in. Please note the sign on the front of the building. It was very reassuring and confirming to me. Now, of course, with our taking possession of the building, we had our name. We changed the sign slightly. The People's Fellowship that owned the building before, we took it off. We put our church name on there. And it remained there until the sign basically began to come apart at the seams. We were having all kinds of issues with it, and we needed to replace it. One last thought as we close. Beginning roughly about the time that we came to this location, the Lord opened the door for us to have a ministry to deaf people, people who could not hear. And that ministry, we, we actually sort of inherited a, a small group of believers who were deaf, unable to hear. And God even supplied us with a man who was our deaf pastor, uh, Brother Perry Bello. Uh, Bello and he, he had uh, a morning service, and then they would come to the evening, we would interpret for the evening services. Now, for those who are unable to hear, visual things become very important. That's what they clue in on. Those are, those are the things that they, they operate. They navigate their world. It's all, it's all visual. So they're very sight-oriented, and they respond to what they see. 
for those years and that they were with us, we were known as the Jesus Saves Church. That's how they thought about us. May God help us this year to regain that title. The Jesus Saves Church.